from the KDAL Studios at Lake and Superior Street in downtown Duluth. It stars over the prairie with eight-time Minnesota Music Award winner Paul Metza. And I wish I could see stars over the prairie, stars over the prairie tonight. Featuring cool people from all walks of life. Check out previous show podcasts at KDAL610.com. The phone lines are open at 218-722-0839. Now, here's Paul Metza. And I wish I could see stars over the prairie. Stars over the prairie tonight. And I wish I could see stars over the prairie. Stars over the prairie tonight. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, out there in the Northland and beyond. If you're streaming the show, this is Paul Metza, host of Stars Over the Prairie, broadcasting live on the big K in the Zenith City by the Unsalted Sea. We are just a stone's throw away from Bob Dylan's way. And if you roll uphill about five blocks from his childhood home, up there at 519 Third Avenue Northeast. We've got a great show today. We've got some good music and a filmmaker and a poet. We're bringing the uh, 612 and the 651 area codes in from Minneapolis. The uh, filmmaker, Mark Ingebrigtsen, has a film that's being shown at the West Theater tomorrow at 2 o'clock called Jay's Longhorn. Let's make a scene about the legendary punk club in Minneapolis that uh, held forth from 1977 to 1982. We're going to play some music from that and talk to uh, Mark about that. He's from the 612 area code. And then in the 11 o'clock hour, all things St. Paul and 651, we've got the great professional baker and poet Danny Klecko, who's going to be appearing today at Fitker's Bookstore from 3 to 5. He's going to do a reading and sign books. So uh, we'd like to give a uh, shout-out to anybody out there celebrating 420 Day today. We've got a couple of... I bri- thought you would be. Uh, <laughs> is it 1973? <laughs> uh, I might have been. It's been a while. You know, it's weird now that marijuana is legal. I never thought it was illegal. I <laughs> But I guess I'm on the safe side. But uh, uh, I'm all for it. I mean, I've been to, uh, you know, uh, people don't remember, but there used to be a thing called pot parties. And uh, I have I was known to attend a few of those. But I've been in a room with people smoking pot, and I've also been in a room with people drinking whiskey. And by the end of the night at midnight when things get crazy, it, they get a lot crazier in the room with people drinking whiskey. So I'm all for it. Plus, it brings, it's going to bring in a lot of uh, tax dollars into uh, the Minnesota fiscal system, which we need. Birthdays today, Jessica Lang, the pride of Cloquet. Tito Puente, who was the salsa king, who I was from Queens, New York. I never got a chance to see him when I was out there. I used to do local gigs. And, of course, also the birthday of Rob Stoner, who is the bass player in Bob Dylan's Rolling Thunder Review, as well as playing on Desire. Now, for you that are in our Aries today, if it's your birthday... This is your horoscope. Dreams and visions about your family. Paint a rosy picture of your future, Aries. These dreams could be prophetic, but don't jump to that conclusion without first analyzing the symbols and discerning what your dreams are trying to tell you. I dreamt last night that my dog was talking, so I don't know what So you were celebrating 420 early, it sounds like. (laughs) Oh... There could be something that you need to consider before you move ahead towards the future that you want to create. But remember that dreams can be interpreted in more ways than one. Joining me in the studio every week here on Stars Over the Prairie is my co-host and tech man and cool cat. Knows everything about the twins and he's going to be talking about the upcoming homegrown festival. Polly G is here and of course Ghostbuster and Ghost Hunter Chris Allen behind the board. Our first guest, the lovely Miss Bell, I'm going to have Chris introduce her, 
But she is going to rehearsal at 11 o'clock. She is playing Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz. Belle, we're happy to have you, but I'm going to have uh, Ghost Hunter here introduce you. <laughs> so <laughs> Belle is a student of mine. Um, uh, they brought me on in order to uh, kind of catch her up a little bit and uh, help her performance skills, which I don't think she needs that much help with. <laughs> but uh, she has uh, practiced like crazy and flourished, and now uh, she's known for singing national anthems around the area. Wow. She Basically, if you go to a sporting event or some type of outdoor event, she's going to sing the national anthem for it. And uh, she's been performing a lot lately, and I'll let her tell you about how she's raising money to go to a summer music program. Okay, so this summer um, I'm planning to go to Nashville, and I've been booking gigs all around locally and just all around and um, basically paying my own way to um, go to Nashville and music places this summer. And um, basically I have a GoFundMe, and um, if you would like to help, um, it is on my website, which is um, bell-official, and my GoFundMe is um, (laughs) Bell. Hold on. You um, can find it right on yeah, the website. Though. It's right yeah. on my website. Yeah. But if you would like to help, that would be awesome. But um, I've been just booking gigs all around, um, paying my own way. And um, I've been just singing since I was eight years old. And I just love music. And my passion for it is out of this world. Um, I've been playing the guitar since I was 10. And thanks to Chris, um, now I can play the gu- guitar really good. Because when I was 10 years old, I was like... <laughs> Um, <laughs> this is not for me, but say, thanks to Chris, I now am like really good at guitar and, um, I do a lot of like singing. Um, I do national anthems. Um, I'm in choir. Theater. And you just played with, uh, some of the local musicians here. They, they yeah. called her out and wanted her to come and play like Lexi yeah. Hooley cool. and uh, Bo Allen and some of the other musicians in the area. Could you sing the national anthem acapella? Yeah. Let's do it right now. Really? <laughs> Want me to? Yes, yes, yes. We're a patriotic bunch here at Stairs Over the Prairie. <laughs> okay. For real? You want yes. me to say well, okay. okay? Oh, say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fights or the ramparts we watched. We're so gallantly streaming And the rockets wriggling The bombs bursting in air Gave proof through the night That her flag was still there Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave? Very nice. Yeah. Thank you so much. Very nice. And we're sending from the we're sending that from Stars of the Prairie Studio to the people of Baltimore and the people that uh, passed away during the tragic uh, uh, bridge come down of the Francis Scott Key Bridge. And uh, we hope they get that rebuilt and those families heal. Now you're going to play a song on your yes, guitar. I am. So does she come along pretty well with her lessons, Chris? Oh, yeah. And actually, uh, I've also been working with her on writing her own material. Okay. And this is actually a tune that she's written. Then, well, so you we get are... to hear this is a, a debut of a Bell original. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Chris. Down a little bit. down the hall 
she doesn't hear Her tears are falling from her face How did she fall from grace? And why is she hated? Mean girls with their sharp tongues Or I see stairs Leaving scars on hearts Like they don't care Ooh. But she's gonna rise like a wildflower Under the rain She's gonna pick up herself every day She stands tall and is proud For she is and look at me now Yesterday, hated a face, Marshall being a better place. Ooh. The hate is how it started. Crying to your friends while you were outed. Now you're wondering why, cause. Mean girls with their sharp tongues or I see stairs Leaving scars on hearts like they don't care Ooh. But she's gonna rise like a wildflower Under the rain, she's gonna pick up herself every day She stands so and is proud of who she is And look at me now She soon be where she wants to be, skylines in music city. Tomorrow you'll be in a bar, your face in the ground while she's a star. And you know the song because mean girls with their sharp tongues are icy stairs, leaving scars on hearts like they don't care. Ooh. But she's gonna rise like a wildflower under the rain She's gonna pick up herself every day She stands tall and is proud Who she is and look at her now Very nice, Belle. Thank you so much, Paul. Now, one more time. Give us the uh, address. Spell out the address of the GoFundMe. It's going to help get some money for you to truck on down to Nashville. Yeah, totally. Thank you. Um, so my GoFundMe is on my website, which is Bell-Official, and it should be Bell's Nashville Journey on there. Okay. So, yeah. And Bell is B-E-L-L-E? Yes. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much. Thank We're you so much for having me. We're going to get you going so you can make your rehearsal at 11 a.m. Yes. Polly G's a bit of a uh, play director up there in uh, Virginia, oh, the uh, Queen awesome. City of the Iron Range, and uh, he doesn't like when his actors show up late. So. No, no, <laughs> and they don't like it when their director is late either. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Bell. Thank you so much for having me, Paul. All right, you have a great day. Well, coming up here in a little bit, uh, we've got Mark Ingebrigtsen. His film is playing tomorrow at 2 o'clock at the West Theater called Jay's Longhorn. Let's make a scene. And I would be remiss if we didn't remember the great Dickie Betts, one of the greatest guitar players to ever strap on a Gibson gold top, Les Paul, who passed away this week at the ed, uh, age of 80. Of course, was the twin guitar attack with Dwayne Allman and the Allman Brothers, and then put out several records under his own name. I've never had the pleasure to hear Dickie but uh, no less an authority than Bob Dylan loved the guy and uh, name-checked him once or twice in some of his songs. So may Dickie Betts rest in peace and power. Paul, what do you got going on over there? Well, you know, there's a lot of good stuff happening around the Twin Ports uh, over the next week or two because of homegrown, Duluth homegrown. There's some pre-homegrown events that are pretty fantastic We've got um, 
uh, Danny Klecko, who we're going to have it here in the studio at um, at uh, Fickers at three o'clock today to um, talk, you know, discuss his poetry and read some poems. I assume Fickers Bookstore or at the Fickers Bookstore. I'm sorry, Fickers Bookstore. Um, we've got uh, a couple uh, great concerts coming up this week that I'm looking forward to. Uh, Pat Donahue on the 25th over at the West Theater. <laughs> Uh, he's bringing some friends, and that's going to be a great show. He's and got the great, uh, my old buddy, he uh, credits me a little bit with inspiring him to play when he was a young child, uh, Pauly Mansich, who goes by the name of P.K. Mayo now. I consider him the best uh, blues guitar player, certainly the best blues slide player in Minnesota, and an Eveleth boy on top of that. He'll be joining him with a couple of uh, their friends, so I'm hoping to get down and catch a, a set or two of that. And of course, Pat is one of the greatest uh, fingerstyle acoustic guitar players in the country. From Minneapolis, St. Paul, which is really a hotbed of great fingerstyle acoustic guitar, of course, you had Leo Kotke, Peter Lang, Pat Donahue, Tim Sparks, uh, Tommy Lieberman, who played played a little bit of fingerstyle, but he uh, uh, not quite like that. And uh, just a whole host of the hotbed of acoustic fingerstyle guitar in the Twin Ports for the last four years, and of course the great Phil Haywood. Yeah, it's going to be just an awesome show. And then special shout out tonight uh, over at Bent Paddle, uh, Boss Mom on the Jabber Hooch. It's Boss Mama's new album, and it's going to be a fantastic show over there. Hey, when's Boss Mama going to be rocking the stars of the Prairie God, Studio? We should check in and see. Yeah. Maybe, hey, maybe we can get her in the next you know week or two to talk about the album or Homegrown or whatever. So we'll go over some Homegrown shows later in the show if uh, uh, if that's what you're into. Otherwise, um, we're going to take a quick second, uh, uh, just in honor of Record Store Day, which is today. And, um, you know, uh, good friends of ours of the show, River City Records. 1814 West Superior Street, where I will be doing a pop-up show That's today right. at 3 o'clock. Yeah, hey, well, there you go. Oh, they're the best. It's a great store, uh, records, CDs, DVDs, and my favorite, they've got tons of used cassettes. That's right. So we're going to... Uh, and books and magazines. And books well. and magazines. VHS, or as I like to call them, the tapes. <laughs> All right, we'll be right back. River City Records and Books, for the best record store of 2023 in the Twin Ports by the Duluth Reader, has in stock thousands of new and used vinyl records, from classic rock to punk, grunge and metal, to hip-hop, rap, jazz, reggae, and dub. Thousands of books, CDs, DVDs, Blu-ray, and VHS. Also a large selection of cassettes, comic books, and music magazines. Stop in and see them at 1814 West Superior Street in the friendly Lincoln Park Craft District. Open 9 to 7, 7 days a week. The United States Deputy Sheriff's Association is a national nonprofit and the largest non governmental provider of services to law enforcement. The USDSA assists city, county, state, and federal agencies with free safety equipment donations and officer survival training, along with cash donations to families of law enforcement officers who perish in the line of duty, a citizen awareness program, and more. For more information on United States Deputy Sheriff's Association, please visit usdeputy.org. Everyone has a community, a neighborhood, school, kids' teams, where you worship, work, work out, or any other place or group where you choose to belong. Communities can provide support when you need it, and even when you don't know you do. Like when it comes to preventing underage drinking and other substance use, community members can be your eyes and ears when you're not with your kids and alert you to signs of potential problems. Learn more at talktheyhearyou.samhsa.gov. You're listening to Stars Over the Prairie with Paul Metza right here on KDAL. All right. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. That was complicated fun by one of Minneapolis's first punk bands, the Suicide Commandos, led by my old buddy Chris Osgood. 
We played that because we're going to be talking about a movie uh, that's playing at the West Theater tomorrow at 2 p.m. We have a musician who is the filmmaker of Jay's Longhorn, Let's Make a Scene, with me right next to me in the studio here at Stars Over the Prairie, broadcasting from the Big K. Tell us a little bit about who you are, Mark, and why you decided to make this movie. Okay. Uh, I'm Mark Angabretson, and uh, let's see. I... Um, you musician I, yourself. Uh, I'm in a, a band called the Silver Teens right now. I actually played at Jay's Longhorn with a band called the MORs, probably 1978 and 1979. And the club, Jay's Longhorn, was there from 77 to 82, and it was really one of the first places where punk rock found a safe harbor. That's absolutely correct. There was, you know, there was, a, there was certain clubs that would, you know, there was a, there was different scenes going on, but. Uh, there wasn't anything at the time in 1977 for punk rock or new wave. And so a lot of the band, like the Commandos and, uh, and Flamingo and the hipster, or the hipsters were King Custom, I think, at the time, a 50s right. band. They were playing ballrooms around the state. And the, I think in the film, Chris Osgood talks about how they'd sneak in uh, it's, uh, their own songs and say, here's a new one by, you know, uh, some famous band. And uh, they, they really didn't have a place where they could just go and play their own music. And and the Longhorn became that. It became a home. It became the, the birth of punk rock in Minneapolis. And it was also a place where a lot of the touring bands uh, from from around the country and Europe played some of their first gigs. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the police played there. Twice. The Ramones. <laughs> Ramones never played there. Oh, they never played. They there. played Kelly's Pub, but okay. they okay. Yeah, and, and that Kelly's Pub was very brief. They they had a few uh, national acts that came through punk bands. So, so name name some others that uh, people sure Blondie, yeah. B fifty twos, Elvis Costello, um, the Dead Boys, um, Cheetah Chrome. Yeah, right. Yeah, and yeah, and so they they'd come and they when they'd be in town they like the clash were in town to play something at the civic center and um gang of four and the buzzcocks were playing at the longhorn and all the guys from the clash just showed up at the longhorn to hang out and i was there that night it was it's like what the hell are they doing here well i i moved to minneapolis in the fall of 78 and there was a scene down there there was also a scene Upstairs at the Longhorn, yeah. there was a jazz club, and there was this great band that played every weekend called Natural Life, yep. uh, featuring Billy Peterson and, and Bill Berg, who ended up playing on Bob Dylan's Blood on the Tracks. A uh, guy, one of the best choral jazz guitar players in the world who's not with us anymore, who I took lessons from, Mr. Mike Elliott. I, uh, $10 a lesson, man, I learned a lot. Uh, Phenomenal guitar player. And then there was, they'd have other bands besides the punk bands. I saw the great saxophonist, uh, Dexter Gordon there. Oh, yeah. And I also saw a great Pat Metheny group show there. In fact, I was going down with my girlfriend, Prudence Johnson, and we got there just as Pat did, and I was able to open the door for him so he could sneak in with his guitar. And I remember it was it was snowing out, but it was a really wonderful show. What, um, when you were... When you were a kid, what did that mean to you to have a place not only to play, but to go and hear all the great music? Yeah, you know, so I, I was 19 when I first went to the Longhorn, and I was a year out of uh, high school and didn't really know anything about m- music and the music scene other than what I'd, I'd listened to on the radio. I guess Led Zeppelin was somebody I was probably a fan of, but there was nothing that I really you know, fell in love with. And the and I'm really good friends with Bill and Ernie Batson. Oh, I love those guys. And so in, like, it was July 2nd of 1977. They took me to Kelly's Pub, that I mentioned earlier in St. Paul, uh, to see the Ramones. And I'd never even heard of the Ramones. And we were, like, in the front row. <laughs> we could, now, where was Kelly's Pub? I'm trying, was that in Lower Town? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And so they, they had a few shows there. The Dictators played there. I think it probably lasted about six months or something like that. But so... I, I'd never heard of this band before, and I just, like, fell in love with them. And uh, the next day, I think Ernie had his birthday party at his house, and it's like, oh, they got it. He's playing their records. It's like, oh, they got a record, too? It's What's this? And then, like, the next week, I'm down at the Longhorn, which had only been open a month, right? to see Curtis A, and uh, just fell in love. Greatest rock and roll singer in the world, as far as I'm oh, concerned. Oh, yeah, I agree with you. 
So let's talk about Curtis A for a minute because we're gonna we're, we got a I believe we got a clip we're gonna pull up of of him. He of course uh, was one of you know they consider him one of the godfathers of the Minneapolis punk scene, and he also the night uh, John Lennon was assassinated in nineteen eighty went down on the Seventh Street entry. Uh, to do a whole night of Beatles songs that he's continued to do. It's one of the biggest shows of the year. Now he's got like a 14-piece band doing it. and uh, But he is a real, not only, you know, some people think he's a bit of a wild man, which he is, uh, but he's still playing. But he's also a rock and roll historian. Have you ever been to his house? Yeah. <laughs> Did you? I hope you taped. I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing the movie, Jay's Longhorn, Let's Make Scene. I hope you taped it in his basement. We did. Uh, we didn't. We, I think we had some B-roll that maybe didn't get used, but you, you can see all the posters and everything on his wall, which is pretty amazing. Well, and plus he's got, uh, I went over there a couple of times. I would borrow suits from him if I had uh, a big gig, and it was so fun. He'd go into his closet, and he'd put these suits over his couches, and he goes, he said once, he goes, you know, I can, if I wasn't a rock and roll singer, so I could be a haberdasher. <laughs> <laughs> I'd go, well, yeah, I'd go, I'd buy clothes from you. But for those of you that have never been to his house, he's got, uh, he's got little scenes set up with little army men and Batman and Spider-Man. He's got like literally, I'm not kidding, 4,000 right. little plastic army men and little battle formations yeah. for whatever the the battle was that he was creating that week. And then the other interesting thing about Curtis, and there's quite a few interesting things about Curtis. Hey, Curtis Olmsted who was named after the Curtis Hotel when he was born. His mother looked out the window, and they didn't have a name for him. And the hospital, I believe, was headed by County Medical Center downtown. Through the window, she saw the sign for the Curtis Hotel, which is how Curtis got his name, though he spells it with two S's. They only had one S. But he's also, and I, I bet he's still doing it, Mark Ingebrigtsen, you might know, he's taped every episode of Jeopardy since 1982. Yeah, you can't call him during Jeopardy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Although the last time I had to call him about something, and I called about uh, 4 o'clock thinking, well, you know, it'll be a half-hour call because sometimes it's a two-hour call. Oh, easily. And I didn't have easily. two hours. And it's like it gets to be 4.30. It's like, well, don't you have Jeopardy? Oh, I can listen to it in the background. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, to each his own. So... Tell us a little bit about Mark Ingebrigtsen as the musician. Yeah, I don't, um, I'm the front man. I'm the vocalist. And I guess what I'm really good at is uh, breaking the tambourine and yelling into the microphone. I, I've got a, a kid, Alma Ingebrigtsen. Who, Chris gives guitar lessons. Okay. <laughs> this is really coming together. <laughs> I've got a kid, Alma Ingebrigtsen, who's a real musician and actually plays uh, in the string section cello with Kurt during the Lennon tribute okay, now, for cool. the last eight years or something like that. But uh, so, you know, you get, I was exposed to this scene and then uh, got up and would sing occasionally with the hipsters. And then there was some friends of theirs who were starting a band back in like 77 or 78 and thought, well, maybe Mark would join us as a front, as a vocalist. So we started the band called the MORs. It lasted a couple of years, morphed into the whole I loves. We put, that lasted about six or eight years. We we put out a record, um, and we were on big hits of Mid America Volume Four, the okay. one that nobody remembers because Volume Three was so great. Uh, and then we broke up, and then I didn't really do anything until um, well, we had a couple of reunion shows, but it, I started buying equipment for Alma, and then we at some some point we had a reunion show. It's like, hey, we can practice at my house. I got all the equipment. Right. And that's like, well, let's let's start another band, and that's when the Silver Teens were born, uh, like 2011. And we've been going ever since. Well, you know, I read something somewhere, and the the guy who wrote it was exactly right on. He goes, if you start playing guitar, like, you know, I started a little young. I started when I was about 10. But, Chris, you could probably uh, chime in on this. You know, most people start 12, 15, but usually like 15, 16, 17, they get their first guitar. And most of them, everybody I know has still uh, has been playing for years and years and years. But really... When you pick up that guitar, you're still the age 
you were when you bought it. Don't you think, Chris? Oh, yeah. Especially <laughs> when you pick up that exact guitar. Yeah. You're still kind of, you fumble a little bit with it like you did when you were a kid. And and uh, it's, it just has that uh, waff of your childhood with it. Well, and then I remember going into uh, Purpose TV and Music, which is on the main drag run by Tony Purpich, who is a great accordion player. My my first gig was playing bass with Tony Purpich when I was in ninth grade. Tony was Rudy Purpich's first cousin, and they were, uh, who's the uh, governor of Minnesota. They were both best man at each other's wedding, and uh, they lived together as kids uh, when times were tough up on the Iron Range. And then Beto's music, which was the Gibson dealer, and you'd walk in, man. If a person could have bought in 1963 or 64 every Gibson that was hanging on that wall that were all about $200 back then, the Les Pauls, the 175s, the 335s, they could retire right now. But the other thing that I remember, Chris, I, you, when you're talking about the, the, the whole vibe and the sights and the smells, was the Tolex the smell of the Tolex on the new Fender amplifiers. Does that ring a bell with you, Mark, yeah. even though you're a singer? Yeah. And then we used to come down to uh, Duluth. We went to Andreessen Sound. Mm -hmm. We picked up a little, what were they? Uh, not, what were the, the Bogan, yeah, our first mixer were those little Bogan mixers. You probably remember those. Oh, yeah. You're a little younger than me, but. Uh, but they were around. Yeah, they were around. Now, Paul, uh, Paul G., did you ever play music at all? Uh, I struggle with pretty much everything I do in life, so uh, yeah. I the the short answer is no. Okay. <laughs> so, Mark Ingebrigtsen, so let's talk about. I lived on Ridgewood Avenue, which was right around the corner from Franklin Lindale, right up the street from um, Rudolph's Barbecue. Okay. And when I started making a little money, and I when I say a little money, a little money. I would go down to the Egg and I at 28th of Lindale for breakfast. And you, for five bucks, you get a breakfast was about 275 I got to know all the waitresses. They were uh, fans of my band, Cats and the Stars, so we'd get our coffee for free. Sometimes when we didn't have money, they'd pick up the bill for us. So I'd go down with a fiver, have breakfast, and have maybe a dollar, sometimes a dollar fifty left. And I'd walk back to 26th of Lindale to Orfolk Joker. Yeah. And I, I still have, I bet, 200 records with Orfolk stickers on it. Because back then, you could get a really good used record for 50 cents or a dollar. So let's talk about, when we're talking about Jay's Longhorn on 5th Street, right uh, a little bit east of Hennepin Avenue, downtown Minneapolis. The first DJ was the guy that ran Orfolk Jokopas, the great Peter Jesperson. Right. Let's talk about Peter. Well, I don't think there could have been a scene without Peter Jesperson. I think he was kind of the glue. He was the center of it, really. I mean, in the film, people talk about there was no radio stations that was backing this kind of music. So not only were they going down to see uh, local bands play original music, but then Peter would be playing, you know, The Clash, uh, right. uh, uh, The Buzzcocks, uh, bands that these people had never heard of before, uh, many of them. And... So they were introduced to it. And then, of course, he had uh, Orfolk Jokopas. He was the manager there. And that was kind of the clubhouse where so many people met and, you know, hung out. And, oh, it was and, a great and, hang. I yeah. mean, I remember I spent a lot of time there and got to know uh, Peter. And then, of course, our great mutual friend that we lost a few years ago, Terry Katzman. Oh, yes. yeah. Terry was – and we'll talk about Terry here in a bit. Uh, but you could go there and you'd see – Bob Mould from Who's Could Do Buying yeah. Records, Dave Ray from Kernery and Clover Buying Records, The Suburbs. And I remember 78, 79 going on there, and a young Tommy Stinson, yeah. who's like 13 years old, well, I'm not going to say he was skipping school. Let's say he was on his lunch break. <laughs> He'd be hanging out because we were hearing about this little band called The Replacements, of course, that uh, Peter discovered. In fact, I chimed in. He's got a. Do you, do you know the name of. I, I, I've got to get his new book, Euphoric. Joy or something. Euphoric Recall. Yeah, Euphoric Recall. It got a guy named Peter Blackstock who wrote for the Austin American Statesman was talking about what a great book it, it was. And I can imagine it is yeah. because Peter uh, was the guy. But write that down, Paul G. We got to get Jesperson on. I'm buying the book. He doesn't have to give it to us. 
Danny Klecko's giving us his book, A Bakeable Feast, but uh, we got to support the music scene. So write that down uh, for a Stars of the Prairie show to come. So when did you get to... Did you get to know Peter when he was working behind the counter at Orfolk, or did you get to know him as a DJ at Jay's Longhorn? You know, what's I, I had a question last night about it, and uh, a similar question. Part of what I was really shy. You know, I was like, I knew the Batsons really well, and I was in a band that played there, and I'd go see, you know, the Suburbs, Chorus Kurt, and all those bands. I didn't talk to the, many of those people at the time, and. Uh, so one of the exciting things for me in doing the project, you know, it took me five years, was actually getting to know these people. Yeah. And, you know, they're people like I was always in awe of Kurt, you know, and um, and Peter, too, and Commandos, all those people. So I didn't I guess I didn't really know them. I wasn't like great friends with them. I was really, really close to the Batsons and people in my band and some other people. But. You know, uh, Robert Wilkinson? No, I I never had a conversation with Robert Wilkinson. The Flamin' O's. Now, so let me ask you, Mark Ingebrigtsen, your your movie that's showing tomorrow at the West Theater, there's a lot of heat going on at the West Theater. I just saw the weight band there, Peter Yarrow the week before, Kathy Matea that's coming up. We're trying to work on getting Kathy on the show here. So I might be able to help with that. That would be great. Yeah. I had her husband, John Vesner, on my Wall and Power TV show a few years ago. So, But, yes, please help with that, Ghost Hunter. And uh, <laughs> But tell us, Mark Ingebrigtsen, when did you wake up and decide, I want to do a movie about Jay's Longhorn? Jay's was, Longhorn. Yeah, it's always been, I think, uh, since probably around 2000, maybe. It's been in the back of my mind. Because, you know, we, my band, The Whole Lot of Loves, we, you know, played a lot at the uh, 7th Street Entry. We were able to open some bands or national bands in the main room and loved the place. But there were, it, the Longhorn always was a special place for me because it was a life changer. And so many people in the film talk about it that way, too. It was really a, a life changer for them. So, it, you know, I didn't, I, I had some experience doing video, but I'd never made a movie or anything. And, at, and I guess the turning point was in, March 1st of 2014, the Suicide Commandos were opening up in the main room at First Avenue for a band called The Sonics that you might have heard about. Sure. Yeah. And it's like, I think I'm going to go and film this. You know, I contacted Chris, and he said, sure, come on down. And First Avenue said, yeah, that's fine if they're okay with it. And so I did that, and then it was like no turning back. Even though there were times during the filming, it's like, why did I get myself into this? But when it... Uh, premiered and we had a number of uh, reunion shows related to it. It was like I'm so glad I did it. You know, we, we sold out the Parkway Theater several times, and there were I I don't think I'd ever seen so many happy people in one place, and it was so heartwarming. I hope me. you got some video of the people that came to see the movie because I'm sure it was a cross section of aging but very cool punk rockers, right? Yeah, and what was also interesting was they brought our, their kids. I hope. Yeah, right. <laughs> there's lots of there's lots of photos. We got a panel discussion that's available that Peter's on. But what's interesting is to me, in some ways, is I've run into so many people in different walks of life that are that are like I didn't know that you were at the Longhorn too. Right. <laughs> so, well, you know, living in South Minneapolis like I did, I saw that whole. The punk scene just kind of grew up around me. And I was really kind of more of West Bank. I'm a you know, folk right. and blues guy is my thing. But I lived around all these guys like uh, Bob Stinson from The Replacements, who was kind of my guitar store and record store buddy because that's what musicians did during the day. They'd, they'd, uh, they'd hang out at record stores and guitar stores. And uh, so we got to be, you know, just, you know, minor friends like that. Really loved the guy. Uh, so different than his public persona during the day. He was the most soft-spoken, kind guy you ever met. And um, he said once, and I think you'll, you'll, you'll relate to this, Mark, he goes, all the great bands in Minneapolis live between uh, Franklin and Lindale. I uh, know Franklin and uh, uh, Lake Street and Hennepin and Lindell. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And they all drank at either uh, Liquor Lyles, the CC Club, or Mortimer's. I used to call that the Bermuda Triangle <laughs> <Yeah>. of alcohol <laughs> or alcoholics or alcoholism. Hey, let's listen. We got uh, not only uh, you a filmmaker, also a musician. Let's listen to a song called Marble Heart. Now, who's, is this your new band? Yeah, it's the Silver Teens, yep. All right. 
Marble Heart by the Silver Teens on Stars Over the Prairie. Mark Ingrid's band, The Silver Teens. Who else is in the band, Mark? Uh, Jerry Johnson's our drummer. Steve Olson's on bass. And you may know Terry Isaacson. Oh, yeah. Terry's a great player. Yeah, he's our guitar player. And we and uh, he's in several other bands, of course. Another person who's an alumnus of uh, Jay's Longhorn. Yeah. Nip and Tuck was the band that he was in that played there. Cool. Well, you know, back then, there was a certain point when they wouldn't, uh, the city stopped letting you post put posters on telephone poles. And in my book, Blue Guitar Highway, I talk about coming of age in Minneapolis when I first moved down. And you could walk down Lindale or Hennepin or even get over to the West Bank. And these telephone poles would be like hieroglyphics with rock and roll posters, really kind of telegraphing the thunder and the sound of the city. Yep. I remember that. And then all that, uh, you know, you remember in a uh, band back then I had... uh, uh, a writer, a friend of mine on, Daryl Moskowitz, who uh, wrote, she was the food critic for oh, the City right. Pages and yeah. more. And we were talking about how much time we both spent at the Kinko's <laughs> okay. in Uptown. <laughs> yeah, I was in there a lot, too. <laughs> yeah, and, and we said, you know, and how much we got away with before they put in the counters on the machine that you had to get at the uh, at the cashier's place. Yeah, we took them for a ride. But... Uh, it was such a do-it-yourself scene back then. Yeah, it, it was. And uh, I think it is now, too, really. But it's just different. I mean, we didn't have the, the Internet really back then as yeah. well. But everybody's you know, putting out their own music and trying to figure out how to get it on different stations around the country, Underground Garage and things like that. And it, so many bands that I know of are doing it all on their own. Yeah. And, but there are some other people around, some consultants who are helping at some of the bands, you know, so... But, well, and you know, we got to give a shout out to Twin Tone, Twin Tone Records. Yeah. For really spawning that scene, I believe Curtis A was the first artist signed to Twin Tone with Paul Stark and Peter Jesperson. Correct. Well, the, there was three. The first three, it was Kurt. Yeah, yeah. and then it was uh, Fingerprints and the Suburbs were the first three records right. that all came out together in those little seven-inch red singles. Right. Or EPs. Uh, yeah, those are the first ones. And now vinyl is back bigger than ever. So where does uh, your band, Mark, the Silver Teens, play? We play, let's see, we play different places. We play the Schooner. We play, uh, uh, what else we got coming up? Um, Do you guys have a website? We've got a website, silverteens.com, and we're on Facebook. Uh, I'm totally blanking. What um, is uh, Silver Teens? What is that? Is that just you made that word up? Or yeah, that... we we got together and trying to come up with a name 12 years ago. And it's really, you know, it's like we're still teenagers at heart, right? But our hair is getting a little gray. Oh, I get it. <laughs> yeah. Cool. yeah, I think that's where that's from. So uh, we, we, we're we playing at Art World coming up. Um, Paul's getting, Paul E.G.'s getting a little gray around the ears, too. I didn't didn't want to mention it. but Oh, Palmer's. We play a lot at Palmer's. Oh. We got the, two gigs coming up. Love the Palm Room. Yeah. Love the Palm Room. And, of course, uh, uh, yeah, that was... Uh, the scene of a lot of fun over the years. Let's just put it yeah, that right. way. Yeah. You know, back you had the uh, South Minneapolis scene. And then if you wanted the, the West Bank scene, 
uh, you had, God, and I spent many nights. There was the Triangle, which was before my time, where Bonnie Raitt, Colonel Rand Glover, sure. and Willie Murphy played and Willie and the Bees. But you could go on a great uh, Friday or Saturday night, really any night of the week, and you could go to the 400 Bar. Palmer's, occasionally they had music up there. Uh, you know, Spider, uh, John Kerner, and Tony yeah. Glover, or Dave Ray had played, but Willie Murphy had played piano. You go over the Viking and see Bill Hinckley and Judy Larson, and all those bands, and myself included, with Cats and the Stars. We played all those places. Then you go a little farther up the street, and you had the Caboose, yep. and the Whiskey Junction, then you had Triple Rock, yeah. which was there for a while. Right, yeah. Yeah, it was just an... All clubs you could do a documentary on. <laughs> yeah. Well, there you go. Now, how did, uh, how did... You had a show last night. How did it go at the West Theater? It was great. It's a g- terrific theater. And ri- I got to say thank you very much to Richard Hansen and uh, Bob Boone. And we got a nice tour of the, the new space that Bob is renovating. It was... Uh, it sounded great, and it looked great, and we had great questions afterwards. It, it was just a great experience. It was... Uh, happy that they invited me up. Yeah, Boone's really lighting that place up over there. It's a beautiful. That theater opened, I believe, 1942, and then was dark for years. Uh, they, I think they got those really comfy seats from a movie theater at the Mall of America, which I okay. refer to in my book as the Fall of America, because <laughs> uh, it's a very comfortable place to, yeah. to to seat, and the staff is great. Lots of stuff uh, coming up. Let's just jump over to Polly here for a minute. What else do you got coming up on Homegrown, Polly G? Well, you know, Homegrown starts in like a week or something, and um, I... There's, I can't. I should probably look it up. I, sorry, I don't have my facts straight here, but there is one day that's um, dedicated to Superior, which I think is awesome. And I don't have the list in front of me, but we'll have to pull it up and see, which I think is a uh, really cool part of Homegrown. Uh, the- you know, I went and saw two shows over there, really wonderful in January. Uh, Al Sparhawk, formerly of Lowe, and Charlie Parr were doing a Tuesday night residency. And... Uh, I can't see enough about the Cedar Tavern and Cedar Lounge, or Cedar Lounge, however they, you want to describe it, over the really good beer. Uh, if you're into a really hoppy beer like I am, go with the Caribou Lake. I went over and took a tour of uh, Flat uh, Earth Rider Brewing with my old buddy uh, Tim Nelson last week. He sent me home with a six-pack of uh, Caribou Lake. I had two, and I'm glad I didn't have to drive anywhere. <laughs> but it was really, really fun. So where is the uh, – Mark Ingebrigtsen, is your movie, Jay's Longhorn, Let's Make a Scene, online? You can buy the DVD online from longhornfilm.com. Uh, it's also available to, to rent and watch on Amazon Prime. Um, and Really? I, that's yeah. very cool. Yeah. I've got an, another screening that's coming up May 15th at Cloudland Theater in Minneapolis. It hasn't really been announced yet, but it should be. Is so that a new place? New yeah, venue? yeah. Our band played there. Okay. Really fun place. Whereabouts it's, is it? It's like uh, right next to Merlin's Rest, okay, across the sure. street from Merlin's Rest. Yeah. Merlin's is Rocket, too. Yeah. Um, well, this is all so cool. I am a big music historian myself, and I love to see this sort of history captured and especially, you know, when it came out, I wanted to see it. I wanted to see it for some reason or another. Uh, I was not able to. So when I was looking through the uh, uh, the Duluth Reader, I saw that they had this, you know, they've got several music films right. coming up. Are you? I know they've got the I Am a Noise, the Joan Baez film. I think the Talking Heads film. Are you familiar with the other ones that they've got going on there? I, Off the top of your head? I, no, I don't. But it's acoustic cinema is what they're yeah, calling it. Yeah, and yours is in Jay's Longhorn Let's Make a Scene is tomorrow. My guest, Mark Ingebrigtsen, he's bringing the 612 vibe here. Coming up at the 11 o'clock hour, we've got Danny Klecko, poet and master baker, bringing the 651 St. Paul vibe. Mark, we want to wish you the very best. And uh, we're going to go out with a little Curtis A. What is your, when you wake up in the morning, you go, damn, I'm glad I got that movie done. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I'm just thrilled I was able to do it. Yeah. yeah. Any ideas for the next project? 
Uh, I've got a few ideas, but it's you know this one was like right on as far as there's so many people that are still alive that had the same feelings as I did. It was life changing. So many of the people still playing music. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'll, I've got some other ideas in the works. Well, if I'm surprised it hasn't been done, but I see a Curtis A. documentary and someone's yep. future. Yep. In fact, let's listen to the world's greatest rock and roll singer right now from Land of the Free. Mr. Curtis say, and then we'll be back on Stars Over the Prairie. Why he didn't become Joe Cocker or, you know, the next big vocalist is beyond me. Like our Minneapolis's answer to Mitch Ryder. When I first heard Kurt sing at the Longhorn, I'd never heard a white man sing like that. Now I go back and I go, okay, Mitch Ryder. One time at the Longhorn, Mitch Ryder asked me for my autograph. There you go, that you can that can be a filler. He was really the teacher. I mean, most people don't know that Kurt Olmsted was, you know, punk rock before punk rock was punk rock. It stars Over the Prairie with eight time Minnesota Music Award winning songwriter, musician, author, and historian Paul Metza. Check out previous show podcasts at KDAL610.com. No. Here's Paul Metza. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Stars Over the Prairie. This is your host, Paul Metza. We are broadcasting from the big K, 5,000 watts of solid power. Goes all the way, that AM signal goes all the way to, up to I Falls, and you get a little north of the city of Minneapolis. In the Zenith City by the Unsalted Sea, just a stone's throw away from Bob Dylan's way. We've got a great guest coming up. But because uh, we're all about music, arts, and culture here in the Twin Ports, maybe I could ask my buddy, Polly G, what's coming up in Homegrown? Can I? Uh, I just want to interrupt because uh, I'm calendar challenged, and I've been saying <laughs> that my band, Underbridge, is going to be playing Sir Ben's on Saturday, May 3rd, and May 3rd is actually a Friday. <laughs> So I would have even been late. The old but Friday, I just, Saturday mix. Yeah. So I wanted to let those who are following the show or following my band, let them know that May 3rd is a Friday, and that's when we'll be at Sir Ben's at And what's o'clock. the band's name again? Unabridged. Unabridged. All right. We've uh, we've been talking about the shows that we're, Mark's, that we're most excited about, but uh, I, I think it's important that we also recognize the venues that are hosting all of these Absolutely. shows the uh the homegrown uh, one of the homegrown social social accounts yesterday probably instagram uh really they they just they posted they, they had a post and tagged all the um uh, all the venues you know the deck bent paddle blacklist caddyshack uh canal park brewing like i mean there, there are shows everywhere and there's a list of about 20, and you can follow all your favorite music venues in the Twin Ports from one post, which is kind of nice. And that's a lot of information digging on Duluth Homegrown's uh, part. So, well, it's amazing. I yeah. mean, it's literally 150 bands yeah. at all these venues. And we got to give a shout-out to, uh, I mentioned Tim Nelson from Flat Earth Brewing uh, earlier, but he and his brother uh, were two of the guys that were the prime movers to get Homegrown started, oh, so many years ago. I don't know, a dozen years ago or so? How long has Homegrown been going? I think you're right, yeah. It's been going uh, at least 10 years now. And uh, it's it's a great way to showcase a lot of the music in the area that you necessarily wouldn't hear if you don't know them. Right. And, and I mean, it's just about every style of music is represented. Yeah, and they're also doing great things for the music community. Uh, they're, this is the couple... Uh, when I say musical community, I mean, you know, beyond... Beyond just having a day of you know week of concerts, uh, they've established this, the um, that gra- the, the grant uh, Palomino grant uh, with Trampled by Turtles, 
And that's a, just a really cool thing. Um, artists can apply for that. And then I think they, I don't know, in the past they've had, like, whoever wins, you know, gets to open for Trampled when they play in uh, down at the lake. But uh, that's just a really neat thing. And, and uh, you know, there's just... It's a great way like for this. bands to get their albums yeah. cut and yeah. finally uh, maybe get some swag made and stuff yeah. like yeah. that. And, and network, things that are challenged for a lot of the bands uh, in the area. It's yeah. such a great the whole the whole everything that Homegrown is doing is is amazing because just you know other communities don't have this. Well, I remember when I was coming up, I was on board of directors. I'd come up once a month for a Rod Raymond and Tim Nelson had an operation when they were partners, and I remember Timmy telling me, he goes, you know, someday. Uh, Duluth is going to resemble Austin, Texas. And I'll tell you, if he wasn't damn near on the money with that, I mean, this is really turned into a, quite a music town. Yeah. I mean, there's Nash- often. Nashville does this too. Yeah. They, all their venues participate, and depending on what type of music it is, that they have those bands play there. Yeah, it makes complete sense. Well, and to uh, show you how diverse Duluth culture is today, there's going to be an incredible poet. Baker at the Fitker's bookstore from 3 to 5, 600 East Superior Street, who's with us in the studio. I want to give him a little introduction. Danny Klecko put out his first book, Hitman Baker, Casket Maker, several years ago. It won the 2020 Midwest Book Award for Poetry for the Midwest Independent Publishers Association. He put another book out called Lincoln Land, his search for Abe Lincoln during the pandemic. He's got a new book out that he sent me several days ago called A Bakeable Feast. I've been inhaling it. Uh, It's just incredible stuff. I had the pleasure, I'd, I'd heard about Danny because I hang in some pretty hip circles, even though they're 612, but I do hang in 651 every now and then, which is the area code for St. Paul, for those of you that aren't getting the reference. But I met Danny in a memorial service for a very good mutual friend of ours, the late great abstract expressionist James Reggae, just a phenomenal painter who actually has a uh, show going on down at the Carnegie Art Gallery in Mankato until uh, started on April 10th, going through the 27th with his studio partner, Matt Manson, also a great real-life painter uh, at the Carnegie Art Gallery in Mankato, the 27th. I'm going to try to hike down there and see it. But I met uh, our guest, Danny, at that, uh, geez, I don't know, it's the end end of summer, I guess. Um, He also lives Caddy Corner from F. Scott Fitzgerald, Old place on Summit Avenue. I had a buddy that used to live in one of those part of that triplex, a guy named Cam Strang. And uh, he recently had a poem called 45 Minutes in Central Park that was picked up online by the New York Times. And then the Chicago Tribune picked it up in the Washington Post. And that's enough of a too long of an intro. But, Danny, great to see you today, brother. Well, thanks for having me. And uh, I bring glad tidings from the capital city. Uh, not to start off, not to start off by correcting my host, but I am not um, a poet who bakes. I'm a baker who writes poetry because you get more swag leading with baker. I mean, <laughs> who's kidding? Who? I'm, a, I'm a poet. No one cares. Baker. Are you a, are you a tortured baker or a tortured I, poet? I, I'm, no, I'm a tortured uh, sourdough baker. So I've been I've been baking for <laughs> the Twin Cities for over 40 years. I'm a master bread baker. I've I've baked for presidents, prime ministers, gangbangers. You this guy, it. this guy, gave a freaking loaf of bread to Mikhail Gorbachev. I didn't. I not only gave him a loaf of bread; they commissioned me because when Gorby came here in 1990, <laughs> Gorby, I like that. You guys are tight. They because he's in. They sought out uh, somebody who could do a bread where him and uh, um, uh, the mayor were going to break it to symbolize peace. Right. So if it weren't for me doing my job, you know, there might be missiles pointed at your house right now, but we got it done. We became friends, and uh, now look at us, us in Russia. We're still well, 
Boy, if you could, if we could only get, uh, and I'd help you bake this a loaf of bread to Putin right now. That would be a <laughs> phenomenal. A I'd recipe. have a few extra ingredients <laughs> I'd put in there. So, Danny, <laughs> you, you're born in Los Angeles, right? Yeah, Inglewood. Okay. And when did you end up in the, in the capital city? Well, I, I, well I, I actually came to Minneapolis first. So when, when I was in elementary school, L.A. to Minneapolis, then when I was like 18, I chased a woman to St. Paul. When I was 19, you know, we got married, and, and then at 19, she left me. And so then I thought, <laughs> what do I do? And I thought, well, I lost the woman. I'll keep the city. I've never left. <laughs> you can always get new women, but you can't always get a new capital city, right? <laughs> well, you know, I, uh, uh, I, I, had a, I, I brought my book. I might, uh, if we have time, I might read one of my poems, if I could be so bold in front of master poet and baker, uh, Danny Klecko. But I, I wrote a piece in here called The Mississippi River Like the Berlin right. Wall. Yep. Because, as you know, there's a lot of people in St. Paul never get to Minneapolis. A lot of people in Minneapolis never get to St. Paul. Now, I've done in my career, I lost count at a certain point, over 5,000 professional gigs, less than 50 in St. Paul. Yeah. Well, all, all of them were memorable, uh, but it's just, you know, the, the cliche is true. They kind of roll up the streets at uh, 8 o'clock. They do, and, and uh, except the only place, we all meet at Tavern on Grand. That stays open until, you know, 1, 2 in the morning. But- were you around when that was O'Donnell's? Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, my yeah. God, that's where Cats and the Stars started right. playing. It was kind of the nice Polonaise room, absolutely, of, of Grand Avenue. Yeah, but w- one of the things that people in Minneapolis don't understand: we never even in St. Paul we don't mention Minneapolis. We just uh, it's referred to it as Babylon. You know, so I mean, <laughs> it's it's it is fun though. I I find it intriguing how so many hipsters from Minneapolis want to do the St. Paul scene. But no, I mean, we have everything in St. Paul. Yeah. There's really no reason to go. It's it's just a whole different vibe. Not well, better. Well, okay, better and different. Yeah, you know? well, you know, I remember when we when the Cats started to play, we used to play in Lower Town at, at Ryan's Corner, sure, which is actually sure. a heavy metal bar. Yeah, absolutely. But uh, so we snuck in, and then we used to play, uh, what was that Irish joint? Um, it's been around forever, uh, a little north of downtown. It'll come to me. Uh, and then we used to play... The Buttery, which was a really cool right. jazz club right. downtown, and, and a few uh, other joints around the place. I always loved, uh, I always loved going to St. Paul. In fact, I was there on when uh, I was there with my co-writer Rick Shevchuk for our book uh, uh, "Blood in the Tracks: The Minnesota Musicians Behind Dylan's Masterpiece" down at KTCA, which I'm sure yeah. you've yeah. you've been a, a guest on, and. I really feel like an adult when I grab that $20 bill and I go down to the St. Paul Hotel for a martini. Right on. Because you're drinking with ghosts down right. there. Uh, twenty two fifty now. It's gone up since <laughs> the last time you've been there. I used to know the manager, so I right. got a good deal. But, yeah, but it's uh, it's it, worth every every penny of that twenty two fifty. You know, when uh, whenever an American president comes to Minnesota and spends the evening, they always stay at the St. Paul Hotel. Yeah. It's not even negotiable. Yeah. Well, and um, the other, one of the great uh, photographers uh, and writers and just one of the most handsome men in the history of America, Gordon Parks, was from St. Paul. absolutely. And then, now you live kitty corner from from where F. Scott Fitzgerald came up in that beautiful redstone triplex. Was that... Did that was that just something that happened, or were you looking to get in the hood? Well, I, I was. My mentor was Carol Connolly, the only poet laureate ever in uh, St. Paul, and she passed during the pandemic. Uh, about a four foot ten, feisty Irish woman, about twenty twenty some years my senior, and she said to me, "You know, because back then uh, I lived over by Crete and Durham in a sure. suburban home." And she said, Klecko, you're never going to make it as a writer until you move to Summit. And I said, like, for real? And she said, Sinclair Lewis, Garrison Keillor, right, right, Patricia right. Hampel, right. Fitzgerald, they all lived there. And she said, I lived there. And, and so I went home and I told my wife, I said, uh, I'm moving to Summit. And she said, what about me? I said, I don't, you can come with, but I'm moving to Summit. <laughs> and I did. And and six months later, uh, Hitman Baker, Casket Maker won all the award. I mean, but Connolly was right. You, I mean, to be taken serious, you have to be a player, you know. And, yeah. and and so nobody cares about the guy who lives on Hartford. But when you move to Summit, 
your thing. <laughs> well, and then you're, uh, uh, you know, I've, I've seen it over the years, too. You're right around the corner from the Selby Dale area. Oh, yeah. Which is totally rock. And then, of course, the, uh, uh, the what what is the great theater over there? Help me out, Danny Klecko. The great theater. The great, uh, it's the black theater over there. That's where August Wilson got his start. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah. We, we should, uh, Lou Bellamy runs it, and it's called the... Not the Palace Theater. No. Not the Fitzgerald Theater. Look at that. Check that out, Paulie. Get that. I am I I'm, uh, feel bad that I'm, I'm not remembering it. Penumbra Theater. Oh, sure. There we go. Sorry. Hey, Danny, let's uh, have it. Number one, so good to see you. Now, you come up to Duluth every now and then because you like to fly kites on Park Point. I, I do. So I'm during the pandemic, I wrote the book Lincoln Land where I drove across America. You know, uh, Abraham Lincoln is the most cited ghost in the history of the world. and But what most people don't realize is he never went west to Council Bluff. So I spent the pandemic driving across America looking. Uh, when I was writing the book, I had nothing to lose, and my publisher started reaching out to my favorite authors, uh, Jonathan France and George Sanders, uh, some Beatles people, May Pang got involved, you know, different oh, people. Cool. Um, Gloria Chapman, Mark David Chapman's wife, she got in the book. Um, but wow. the most interesting person was Lay Finger because he did Virgil Wander. He lives in Duluth. And uh, so I ended up, my publisher sent his publisher a thing saying, my uh, author has just won the Midwest Book Award. He'll trade it. He'll give it to Leif if he'll fly kites with him because I've flied for years. Leif Anger is one of the greatest uh, kite crafters, makers in the nation. People really? don't know that. And uh, so we went to Park Point. And you got to hook me up, Clacko. You yeah. got to hook me oh, up. Oh, yeah. And, and we go up there. He, right now he's in North Carolina. He's coming back. I might see him at my show today. But uh, So I come up every four or five weeks. I leave at four in the morning. Uh, we fly for two, three hours. I'm back by noon. My wife's just getting off the couch by the time I'm back, you know. So, but it's 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 a win-win. There's no place more beautiful on the planet than Park Point. Yeah, absolutely, Danny. Let's uh, let's let me let me read something yeah, of yours. Let's when do you, it. When you sold me, uh, uh, sent me a bakeable feast. I opened it up, and man, I was I was in my. Uh, uh, recliner for about an hour just going through and going through and I only got through half because I'm a very slow you, reader but uh, but uh, you've got you got all of these poems are titled Baking Memory Number I'm going to read Baking Memory Number 94 that thinks apropos for our conversation today with the great Danny Klecko here we go chefs follow trends Bakers follow science. Chefs, man buns. Bakers, croquettes. Best chefs are coastal. Best bakers in flyover country. Chefs dream of becoming celebrities. Bakers dream of vampires flights. Chefs wear clogs. Bakers wear red wing boots. Chefs run from ghosts. Bakers run toward God. It's pretty good. <laughs> pretty good. That is damn good, Danny Klecko. And, uh, and, and I... Go ahead. Well, I love the way, and uh, uh, Marianne Grossman, who is a, a very good friend of yours, is kind of the first lady of letters, really, in St. Paul. She's been a literary critic for, for years and years and years. Um, and and I, I read, I, I tracked down a great interview with you last night with uh, my good friend, Pamela Esplund. Sure, sure. Who, who we miss dearly. And she goes, Klecko is so cool. He don't need periods. He don't need commas. No. He don't need quotation marks. I don't need any of it. I just, <laughs> you know, the punctuation. Either you, it's like the Stones. You know, people say, why don't they put their lyrics in the elms? It's like, if you don't get it, then just move on. Right. Well, I'll tell you, just, uh, and this isn't for your audience, but this is personally for you, Paul. Uh, I think it's Baking Memory number 53 is about our mutual friend, Eric Shogren, but he's listed as the Russian general. So okay. do some homework and check that out later. Well, I, uh, yeah, the other thing, you know, when you, the beautiful thing about life is the uh, six degrees of separation. And, uh, what, you know, my favorite Bob Dylan line from It's All Over Now, Baby Blues, take what you've gathered from coincidence. So years ago, I had met a guy in a bar. And uh, Eli's Pub, downtown 12th right. and Hennepin. And uh, we had, we're diametrically opposed politically, but we both love Frank Sinatra and Bob Dylan and Miles Davis, which is one of the reasons why we're hanging out at the bar. And, of course, uh, 
the fellow you're talking about, Eric, lived upstairs. And he told me Eric was a very uh, enterprising entrepreneur and had a, had a few bucks. He told me one night, he said, Metz, if you ever need money and not to fix your car, not to buy a new guitar, let me know. And uh, so I was getting ready to uh, leave Minneapolis. I had sold out the Guthrie Theater with a 10-piece band, probably the biggest show in my life. And two days before, uh, I had broke up with my manager. I was doing all the promo, do all the rehearsals, get all myself. And I go, man, I got to tape this show. So I made a few calls that after literally two days before the show to find out somebody I could get a mobile. This was back to get a, you had to get a mobile truck to do it. Right, right, You couldn't right. just hold up your phone yep. and tape it. And I go, I call him, he goes, I need 2500 bucks, And it's, I go, I know where I'm going. So at about 12 o'clock, midnight, I rambled on down to Eli's Pub that our buddy Eddie Nagel ran. I saw Eric sitting there at the bar. I told Eddie, I said, to mix us up, uh, two doubles, martini, straight up dry, one olive. We had it, and he goes, uh, I said, Eric, remember that when you offered to uh, fund a project? Because, yeah. I said, well, here's the project. I need $2,500 to tape my show at the Guthrie. He takes out this old battered checkbook out of his back pocket, writes it to me on the spot. So that was done. And about several years later, he called me up. He said, hey, you want to pay me back? I go, yeah. Well, he was living Moved to Moscow, married a Moscow woman. Yep. Then they ended up in Novosibirsk, which is actually the sister city the, of St. Paul. And that's where I met him. I met him in Novosibirsk. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Well, here we go. More, right. more connections. So I went over there to play uh, at his club called the New York Times. And as my way of paying him back, I'll never forget. So it was a 24-hour trip. And, and Eric's mother sent me with about a 70-pound bag of Barbie dolls for, for her grandkids that she had never met. And I'm trucking them through cowboy boots, guitar, duffel bag full of Barbie dolls through uh, Minneapolis and New York and then Moscow and layovers. And I'm on the plane now. We're going to Novosibirsk, and it's, I don't know, it's around midnight. I'm sitting next to this guy. He was dressed like a peasant, really. And he had a Walkman and little wire room glasses. And we were in the back. Everybody was sleeping. We were back when you could smoke on a plane. Right, right. And we're having a cigarette, and he's smoking, of course, uh, non-filtered whatever. And he hands me this bottle out of his chest pocket. Didn't have a didn't have a label on. I go, oh, yeah, we're moonshine. Yeah, let's rock that. So he, he gives me a bump up his moonshine, and I nodded to him. I said, what are you listening to? You know, because he didn't speak any English. I didn't speak any Russian. And he gave me the uh, the uh, headphones, and I put them on my ears. And just as I put them on, I, I heard, I shot a man in Reno just to watch right, him die. Right. And I go, there we go. Johnny Cash is a universal language. Bring it on, over yeah. Spirits. And, and their their moonshine is summer going, and it's like <laughs> it's like stronger than ever clear. I mean, you, you yeah. wake up in a different province after drinking that. <laughs> and, stuff. and your eyesight's different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. it'll right cure on. like nearsighted. Now, how did you end up at Nova Spirits? I some of that I, I probably won't get into, but I, I did some things with the government, and I've worked everywhere from the Asiatic Arctic in the diamond pits of I Hall, Nova Spirits. Uh, Olympic bids down at the Black Sea, Glenja, Krasnodar, wow. stuff like that. But uh, and, and you know it's yeah you know in the book Hitman Baker Casket Maker you will find out that my mother's second husband was connected a little bit with right. people and and everyone when you when you hear people everyone thinks Godfather but there's a lot of people who aren't necessarily in the syndicate but who are connected into things that aren't advertised. So right. I was doing things like that. So, well, let's, uh, uh, I'm really having a great time talking to you, and great seeing you. Of course, Danny Klecko, uh, Master Baker, who happens to be a really good poet, is at uh, Fitcher's Bookstore today from 3 to 5, reading and uh, signing books, buy books, and uh, and hanging out and being a cool cat. Why don't pick whatever you want? Well, I got two, uh, two for, but I, whatever. But the first no, no, one, you read whatever you first want. First one man. I'm going to do, well, I, I found the one that you were asking for, and we can get back to that, yeah. but this one, Today's 420 day. And uh, here, here's, and for a guy who hangs out in bookstores and anyways, I think this is apropos. And this is the cool thing about being an old man poet. Anything that comes up, you got a piece somewhere in a book, something to cover. So this is called City Lights Bookstore. 
After eating pasta, I popped in, hoping I might catch Ferenghetti. He wasn't there. I strolled ground level, becoming disappointed. The store seemed nice, but not legendary. Until I saw a staircase and climbed it. Up top was a room filled with people reading poetry. If wardrobe served as an indicator, these customers were mechanics and nurses, not MFA writers. I felt happy and jealous. I picked up a copy of Vizlana Zimborska's collected poems. A guy in a flannel noticed and asked if I had been to Poland. I said, no, have you? He said, no, but he'd been to Amsterdam. I asked if he made it to the Anne Frank house. He said, yes, but he got stoned before entering, and it was too much, and he had to leave. Then he advised me not to get stoned if I went. I told him I'd keep that in mind. Happy 420. <laughs> <laughs> Danny, what, uh, so you also had something that went viral. Uh, yeah. Just just not too long ago. To, uh, I mean. A, a poem you wrote called, what, 45? 45 minutes in Central Park. And, and then actually I, it, it became a big deal. I became friends with the, with the editor at the New York Times because he used to play in a band. Um, and he was on, on Twin Tone. So he really? knew. What, what's his name? Ed Shanahan. Okay, and, I know and, the name. And so Ed, like said, and, and he called me because I sent it. Uh, my, I had my publisher send the poem. He contacted my publisher and said, "We don't go a second hand. We got to talk to him." And she said, "My author doesn't use computers." And he said, "I googled this guy. <laughs> He's everywhere." And she said, "You're going to have to call him." So he called me. We talked a little bit, and he said, "I want to get you in." And and. Uh, I want to represent someone from the Twin Cities. Then he told me how he was fond of the music scene in the 90s. And right then, we all know, because I'll tell you something, any food writer, any poetry writer, I mean, these guys all wanted to be music writers. They just didn't have a slot for it. Right, right, right. So now I know he's into the replacement. So I say to him, oh, so you're a Husker guy, right? And then he said, no. And then I dropped some F-bombs on him. I said, Husker do is much better than, and we started this (laughs) big fight. And next thing you know, he put it in. But after that, then he put in. Uh, so I mean, I had like three poems in there within. Uh, you know, it, it was it was a big deal. It was very helpful to me or whatever. But this is the poem. And then it ended up. Uh, the Washington Post picked it up. Yeah, and it yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I've been yeah featured in the. And not only did they, but then they did a feature on Klecko and stuff like that. Really. And, uh, yeah, and, and we're know. with we're with freaking royalty right here, Minnesota six five one. <laughs> wow. Zip code royalty, or that area code royalty. And let me tell you, kids out there, because I I know right now a lot of you want to be me, and uh, and I I get it, I fully understand it, and I'll tell you, if you put your nose to the grindstone, you will make about seven hundred dollars over your poetry career. So with that said, that's wow, so that's, that's good, so bad. <laughs> right? Hey. Here we go. Um, Forty-five minutes in Central Park. Between the hours of nine and ten, on a bench adjacent to mine, sat a man who is not put together, a man in the grip of some battle. Big drops of rain began to fall, raindrops by the tablespoon. The man refused to move. A woman with a terrier stopped as if she knew him, offering dry escort underneath her umbrella. The man began to cry. What determines luck? Who makes up the rules? Why is value attached to everything but me? The woman sat by his side, put her arm around his shoulder, and silenced the umbrella twirled until she offered explanation Everything will be fine, she said. Just not today. Oh, that's Thank beautiful. you. Thank that you. That was awesome. 
So yeah, yeah, that was like a mic. That was a mic drop there. He just handed the book drop. after he read it. <laughs> that was a literary mic drop yeah, right there. Yeah, yeah, Klecko yeah. Is, Klecko's a rock and roller, man. You just tell by, I saw it before I met him. I go, yeah, this guy's a rock and roller. He might be Danny Klecko. Yeah. So what? Um, let's talk a little bit about our friend uh, James Reggae. Jimmy Reggae. We call him the Rage. That's how you and I met at his memorial service. I met him when I was playing at. Uh, um, McCready's Pub in downtown Minneapolis in about 1983 or 84. Uh, Tom Arnold was doing an open stage right. down there. I was sitting around one night. to come down and sit in on my set. What's no easy task following Tom Arnold, I might add. And there was a guy sitting there. Oh, I hope you got a chance to meet over the years. And because uh, I was, you know, voracious reader, I was reading all the, you know, St. Paul Pioneer Press and right. Twin Cities Reader and the New York Times. I mean, I was just read, 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 read. And uh, I was sitting there and, and Tom and everybody, yeah, that's my friend David. I said, Dave, what do you do? He goes, I'm a writer. I said, well, what's your last name? He goes, David Carr. I go, oh, there you go. You are Boom. freaking David Carr. Boom. I was such a huge fan. So and then uh, not long after... Carr and Arnold and I became kind of three musketeers sure, sure. running around town, uh, opening bars and then uh, – or closing bars, then opening those same bars right. the next day. Um, but so there was a great guy there named Jim Reggae who was bartending. We got to be really good friends uh, and we'd hang out and all of a sudden he introduced me to his artwork and uh, – uh, I don't know much about painting. All I know is he was really, really good. Yeah, yeah. You could feel it. You could yeah. feel Jim Reggae's painting. Talk about our mutual friendship. Well, Reggae. and part of it, in, in what my hospitality connection. See, Jimmy married uh, Erica. Yeah, Erica, and and she's the bartender at the Black Forest. Her family owns it. And I've known Ricky for I don't know fifteen years. So I met him through her. And and Jimmy was a a salt dog man. He was an ornery cuss. Oh, he, he was a complete a hole on every level. But until was, you got to know, him. yeah, well, yeah, in, in all the best ways. And so I'd go into his studio and I'd point out things and I'd start you know, as a guy who doesn't know anything about art but has opinions. I'm giving him, and he would just beat me up in front of the whole crew. <laughs> and and it That's was the rage. It, it just became so much. And he. Hung out with my mom's second husband, the connected guy. Really? So, oh, they all know. That's all South Side. It's all South Side. Take I mean, what they, you they were all from coincidence, and, right? Uh, right? But uh, the, the thing that, you know, I, I started buying paintings from him. I started, and we became pretty close. And the, the biggest thing that I learned from him, he told me, you know, you don't necessarily have to study poetry to become a good poet. You just have to learn how to see what's beautiful. And for a guy who was such a, you know, a surly guy. He had this heart that was just generous and giving, and he taught me things that I'll never be able to repay him for. So, I mean, um, but, yeah, he's he's a good cat. I miss him, but, you know. Uh, he, uh, you know, we, uh, I remember we had a couple-year run there where I'd get done with the gig. He'd get done with the bartender at Eli's. I'd pick him up after he cleaned up about one thirty. We'd go to my place at 1818 LaSalle. Uh, which we used to refer to as 1313 Mockingbird Lane, right. on the third floor there, and we'd put on uh, some some jazz and uh, open a bottle, maybe have a few party favors, and just talk about art and yeah. life for two or three hours. He taught me more about art than than really any any one man, uh, I, and, and we became really, really close. Well, like you, I mean, you, you even mentioned the word Bob Dylan, you're screwed. Because that's a four. Yeah. It's four hours. You're shut down, yeah. you know, and, and it just goes on and on. Well, you know, and, and great, I like Bob. So the, the great story about reggae. So he's, uh, you know, the one thing why we love hanging out at Eli's Pub at Twelfth and Hennepin was the uh, both Eddie Nagel and Jim Reggae had such great taste in music, and right. they had stacks of CDs. Yep. We go in there, and uh, so one night it's uh, I don't know it's dinner hour. You know, you're 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 in the service industry, you know, with that a busy Friday night, seven, eight, uh, you know, eight o'clock, you need to keep those tables, make that money, turn those tables. And uh, Reggae's playing some crazy jazz. And Eddie Nagel comes out of the kitchen and comes 
Jimmy, he goes, people are leaving. He goes, this stuff's too crazy. He goes, Eddie, this is John Coltrane. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you, you were talking earlier about his uh, show in Mankato. And it's sad. You know, I saw him. I went to his studio, and I visited him two days before he died. Oh, man. And, uh, but he was talking, and he told me, he said, and everyone else thought he was going to be alive when the show came out, but he said, I won't be. You know, I mean, he, he knew what was coming. Yeah. But so I went to the show last week, and they had that big, I don't know, six-by-six-foot painting that was in Eli's. The owner ended up giving it to Jimmy. Oh. You know, and so, I mean... It's the worst painting on earth, but it, it, yeah. it's, it's beautiful because these two guys loved each other and they, you know, kept the bond going. So to see it amidst all of his work for, I mean, you talk about 12th and Hennepin. I mean, I'm 60 years old. When I was 18, 19 years old, uh, we living downtown, going to school at Dunwoody, working in bakeries. I used to cash my paychecks there. Yeah, you know. Right. So I mean, you know, you, where, where where do you get to do that? And anymore? then and then go spend them at Mickey's next to the yeah, airfield. Right, right. right. <laughs> Paul, you look like you wanted to jump in there for a minute. Well, just a reminder to everybody: not only is it four twenty, but it's also it's also record store day, and uh, we are fortunate to live in an area that has record stores and bookstores and and other great places to go that you know places like I grew up where I could check out all the time and so uh, before we jump out to uh, a message from River City Records I hope you'll indulge me as I share a couple lines of a poem that I read on Thursday. Let's do it. I have it memorized. Yeah. Okay. Um, You're no Dylan Thomas. I'm not Patti Smith. This ain't the Chelsea Hotel. We're modern idiots. That's by um, the one and only Taylor Swift from the Tortured Poet Society. <laughs> all right. Uh, 31 <laughs> tracks of Wonderful material, and she's got, I mean, talk about selling albums and records. You know, she's on top of it right now. They've got them over at River City, so um, everyone go support them. I think our guy's playing a show at River City. Uh, I will be there at uh, 3 o'clock. 3 today. 3, to 3 o'clock 4, today. Playing some stuff. In fact, uh, the first person that shows up and said, I heard Stars Over the Prayer on the radio gets a free signed record. If I get done early enough, I'm going to go over and see Klecko over at the uh, Fitker's right. Bookstore. He's there from 3 to 5. I just I just want to point out, I mean, there's no one hotter than Taylor Swift, but when you hit white hot, where do you go next? Of course, you go to poetry. I'll just <laughs> throw that out there. <laughs> Here's a message from River City Records and Books. River City Records and Books, for the best record store of 2023 in the Twin Ports by the Duluth Reader, has in stock thousands of new and used vinyl records from classic rock to punk, grunge and metal to hip hop, rap, and jazz, reggae and dub. Thousands of books, CDs, DVDs, Blu ray and VHS. Also a large selection of cassettes, comic books and music magazines. Stop in and see them at 1814 West Superior Street in the friendly Lincoln Park Craft District. Open 9 to 7, seven days a week. It stars over the prairie with eight-time Minnesota Music Award winner Paul Metza. Welcome back, folks. Stars over the prairie. We got a hot foursome here. We got Ghost Hunter Chris Allen on the board, Paulie G co-host, and my good friend Danny Klecko, baker and poet, who will be reading and signing books from three to five today at Fitker's Bookstore, six hundred East Superior Street. That's what I was talking about before. I'm going to read a, a poem from my book, Alphabet Jazz, which happens to be for sale, Polly, at River City Records for Danny and I's good friend, Jim Reggie. This is called Yellow, Red, and Blue. We did our best work after midnight just before last call while the moon winked at us kindly and gave us a solid pass. The sunrise soon to kick our ass. Tip jar money in both our pockets will be spent soon enough. The money never mattered. That night or any other day, the invisible beauty between both still and beating hearts. Liquid vibrations and lines of love, art and life in common. We talked about our mothers. We shared the latest dirty joke. Played bebop jazz on the midnight radio. Just loud enough to not wake up. Babe, the octogenarian landlady who loved Danny Kay, off in dreamland after listening to Boris Karloff on Real Real Tapes from Another Time by Firelight Tiffany Lamps, who would soon be enjoying her daybreak breakfast, always a banana and oatmeal. There's a lesson in that. More brown whiskey medicine for us. As 
We, you, as you constructed abstract expressions by Rothko, Pollock, and your favorite Franz Klein, spontaneous brush strokes and splashes, all touching the divine, your eye jazz paintings, my unarranged prairie songs, as we encouraged each other, and dare I say, learn from each other as well. We sp- stared into that crystal ball, knowing 30 years from now you'd still be dripping paint, my song still bouncing off the wall, and so it is, my friend, nothing ever changed. Brother to brother, midnight chance, before that stumble home, pre- preserved now in electron amber, and all things being equal, we beat the freaking odds. Bravo. <laughs> hey, um, let me ask you, Metz, uh, as a you know prolific songwriter, and you're pu- pushing out poems, do you handle the poems different than you do the lyrics of the songs, or does it come under the same umbrella? How does that work? Well, you know, I, I'm glad you asked me that, Danny Klecko, because I always go back to Paul Simon that said, you know, we Paul, Simon and Garfunkel never got a lot of groupies, but I had a lot of uh, college English students ask me up to their a dorm room to read poetry, and they'd always ask me, what do you write first, the, the words or the lyrics? What do you write first, the words or the lyrics? That's a punchline, guys. Yeah. I got it. I'm blank staring at you. I'm thinking groupies, Simon and Garfunkel groupies. I was one when I found my parents' records when I was 13 years old, you know, at the, at the house my, in an old trunk, and well, I was sold. I, I, I got to tell you, you know, I don't want to make Paul feel bad, but because he's spent a life being a, a Simon rock. or Metza. Metz, okay. I'm sorry. Uh, well, maybe Simon, too. I don't know the whole paranormal experience, because maybe they have groupies, too. What's well, Pablo Day um, today? But, so. but, but uh, uh, with Metz, uh, you know, it's been a, you know, kind of a scene for making it happen, but there's no groupies like poetry groupies. I'm just telling you. They're all freaks. They're all freaks. Oh, I bet. And tattooed. Oh, uh, yeah. And, and, well, we'll talk about it off. No, there. no, but uh, getting back to your question, uh, uh, seriously, uh, I write a lot. Um, I'm, a, I'm a type guy. Paul E.G. were talking the other night. He goes, you were, he was half in the bag when he called me at midnight. But he said, <laughs> Metsy, you're such a boomer. Well, I'm a, I'm a typewriter guy. You know, I love banging on the top. 52 words a minute. Mrs. Krauss loved great typing. And so I just like to sit down at a typewriter or I'll sit down and write, you know, like you do. I'm sure, Danny, you're at a, a restaurant or maybe on a plane. And you're just jotting down ideas. I do that. Right. And a lot of times, boom, I'll read it, you know, when I sober up or the next day, whenever it was, I go, oh, that's a great line. That's a title. Right, right, that's right. A line. That's, a, that's a great last line for a song. Yeah, absolutely. And then there's times when I just go, okay, I have, like, uh, my song Stars Over the Prairie, that's the theme song for this show. I was driving up north uh, to Lake Vermilion, where the Metza family cabin is. Beautiful dusk, a uh, little north of Cotton. Beautiful dusk, pre-darkness came in with all these beautiful stars. And I just said, I wrote down, I had a, I, I still, I drive with a yellow legal pad next to me. And I said, stars on the prairie. Right. And I got up to the cabin and grabbed my guitar, went on the front dock. I wrote the thing in about 45 minutes. So uh, there's some some stuff that's, that's literally four songs. But what I love about freeform poetry there's a lot of ideas there, and it's you know, uh, you tell us about your writing process where you just you have to let it go. What what is your writing and editing process? Well, you know, I mean, what I do, I'm writing 24 hours a day. Right. I mean, I I, I don't sit down in an office and say, you know, my life is just so interesting. Right. You know, like I say to MFA people. You know what? You sit in a room and think things. No, I just live in the world, right. and I constantly right, right. text notes to myself about what I just saw and then I go home and usually later in the evening I cocktail and then I organize I'm like you know the serial killer movies where they have the spider web with all the pictures I have like 15 clipboards with these different things and I start pulling phrases and different things and then then I you know put them on And, and, and that's I think everybody has their own way but you know if you try to sit down and go from wire to wire it not, it, it's never going to be as good. You got to sleep with it. You got to eat with it. You right. know, for days, weeks, sometimes years to to really get what you're trying to. Well, your gig as a baker has got to be kind of cool because you you know you you make the dough, you roll the dough, you put it in the oven, then you got your 15 or 45 minutes or whatever you do. Right. 
had, I have to imagine you've burnt some loaves of bread over the years when you're on a run with the poetry. Never, never. No, master, <laughs> master bread baker. But, That's incredible. No, no, I, I, I have. I, to be honest, I, I absolutely have. And, uh, uh, but you know, it's, it's just. And then the thing is, though. But right when I think that when I'm in the midst of this, that uh, I'm on my topic. Then some pissed off chef will call me, right? And now that becomes the focus, and and then I start <laughs> taking notes on that instead of, you know, the duck flying over the lake or whatever, right, whatever right, it is, right? You right. Know, but uh, it, uh, it, can I shift gears here, real quick? Oh, absolutely. Do so whatever you want. Man. You're paranormal. Yes. So I got to be uh, the keynote speaker at the Palmer House. Oh wow! Um, last year for the Sinclair Lewis thing, and they put me in room 21. I mean, I've gone. To Savannah, I've gone across the nation to different. Th- I'll tell you that Palmer House. I mean, it, it was legit. I it's mean, no joke. Yeah, it, I mean, I saw. Th- you know, I mean. So, ha- have you been there? Have you experienced? That I have place? not, but uh, people from my group they were there when you gave the speech. Oh, okay. So, yeah, they've been in there. We uh, members of our group have been in there, and they came back saying the same thing. This is no joke. No, I mean, you know, some people are always looking for the demon underneath every rock. Yeah, I was. Not I was telling about the, what the Palmer House is. I've been there, but the Palmer House is in Sock Center, and it's where Sinclair Lewis. He actually worked there as a young man, and so they have this convention every year. The keynote speaker called in sick, you know, twenty less twelve hours before she was supposed to perform. They gave her fifteen months to put together the presentation. Yes. They asked me if I could do it fourteen hours before, and then I. Ended up staying up all night partying with the staff at the Palmer. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I I went to bed at 2, and I got up at 4. But I'm, I'm telling you, I mean, this is no joke. Lights were turning on and off and moving around. There was noise. I mean, and I, and I thought to myself, is someone pulling a prank? But, I mean, who's going to – I mean, I'm nobody. So why would you wake up at 2, 3, 4 in the morning? Yeah, and you're do, not going to document no, like everybody else No, it, it was just – but because I never said I was even interested in the paranormal or whatever, but – Oh, it's some serious stuff. I get goosebumps thinking about it. You know what? The other crazy thing about the Palmer House, uh, I was traveling through and I had to go, of course. Uh, Sinclair Lewis, what's his exact quote uh, about the last bastion of democracy is going to come carrying an American flag and, and, a Bible. and a Bible? Yeah. You know, what? what's kind of cool, when I was there, I ended up meeting uh, his nephew, who's like, I don't know, in his 80s guy's blind he was blind in in the the war right and so we're having afternoon cocktails and uh um i say to him hey uh, did you ever go to greece or not greece i'm sorry rome where sinclair died and see his grave and then his wife said no he's buried here and i said no he died in rome and she said well no they sent the body back and i said will you show me and they said come back next week so i drove back the next week they took me to the grave, and we we're looking at it. It was pretty interesting. Then we went back to the Palmer House, a couple cocktails. And the blind guy says to me, by the way, if you ever want to commission some woodwork, I do you know, all kinds of projects. <laughs> and, and I looked at him like it's a setup for a joke, right? right. And I said, what would I get from you? And he said, you know, I make really good boxes to hold ashes. And so I swear to God, I commissioned the guy, and it has his name uh, on it, uh, Lewis, um, Dick Lewis. So when I die, my family wow. has instructions, dump them on Sinclair's grave. I'm not going under. I don't want to be under the Beautiful. ground. Beautiful. Right. I'm going to be on top. Well, the thing about the Palmer House that, that, that blew my mind, they had little, uh, uh, you know, old pictures. This was like, uh, you know, one of the Kodachrome 1960s right? pictures with Lauren Green <laughs> because he married a woman from Sox Center. Did he really? Yeah, and he. when you go back, you'll see it, and it's on one of the walls, and he was in the Sox Center 4th of July parade with his wife from Sox Center, and this was like, you know, the height of Bonanza. Right. <laughs> so, uh, Danny, what are you, Danny Klecko, this has been so much fun. Are you staying overnight? What are you doing? I am staying overnight, but real, real quick, I just want to throw this out there. Uh, for those of you who are going to be in uh, the Twin Cities next weekend, yeah. I'm doing a fireside chat with Isabella Rosalini. Wow. wow. So um, we're going to be at the International Market Square. Wow. And it's it's a fundraiser for Home for Life. Uh, it's, I think it's 100 bucks a ticket, but they stopped selling tickets on Monday. But it's going to be a big deal. And uh, What's Home for Life? I'm sorry. Home for Life is... Uh, they, they they take care of animals, so basically, and there's a million different animal shelters, and they're all good, but these people, I mean, 
they put wheelchairs on like disabled right. dogs. I mean, they're hard, hard, hardcore. And uh, I've worked with them over the years, um, emceeing different shows. But this is going to be. A, I mean, it's Isabella. Oh. You know, so we'll be a, a week from today. Isabella from today. Dog Rescue. I am so there. And ticket sales <laughs> are cut off Monday. Ticket sales okay. are cut off Monday. Right. Uh, Danny Klecko, you know, we just got a few minutes left. It's been so much fun. Tell us about two things. Your first literary influences. Secondly, your next project. We've got four minutes left. Okay. Uh, my next project is New York. Uh, I'm, I'm writing about New York. Uh, all the great. You know, right now, i got to be honest with you, Minnesota doesn't have enough for me. The yeah. ceiling's too low. Fitzgerald, Lewis, all those cats, they had to go out east. So I've been going out there. I've been bugging people. Uh, who are my influences? You know, I got to say, if you read my work, I mean, it bounces back between Dr. Seuss and Ernest Hemingway. Because, yeah. I mean, I like to have cadence in the poetry. I like to have rhyme in it. But, uh, you know, Hemingway, the thing I appreciate about him more than anyone, he doesn't use adjectives. He's, you know, I, I prefer to read journalists than authors. Right. You know, journalists sure. are tight, clean, and that's the way I go about it. We got Danny Klecko. He's going to be at... Fitker's Bookstore today from 3 to 5, 600 East Superior Street. Paulie, do you got a little uh, roundup for what's yeah, going on? Yeah, you know, Homegrown? I wanted uh, earlier in the show, I had mentioned that uh, there's a day kind of during Homegrown dedicated to Superior, and I just wanted to. Uh, Soup Town. Soup Town, and that's Thursday, May 2nd. So we're going to have actually one more show here before Homegrown starts. So we're, gonna, we're working on getting some artists in here to play a little bit. But on. On uh, Thursday, May 2nd, there's all kinds of good stuff over in Superior. T. Galaxy and the Common Thread are playing at Havana's Mississippi Mike Wolf at the Superior Tavern. Uh, our friend Kaylee Matuziak, Matuziak, I believe, is playing um, that night. I think she's at Earth Rider. And then Thor Leesman at Earth Rider is also going to be there. And just a good, a good lineup of, of stuff. Uh, and then just some big shows coming up. But... Really excited. Sorry the twins aren't very good, you guys. My apologies. <laughs> so, so, Paul, are you going to buy any vinyl today? Oh, gosh. I don't tell my wife. Don't tell my wife. <laughs> I, I, I was thinking Not to stuff. play, but he might buy, yeah. buy something to wear. <laughs> I'm, I'm good. They have a deal over at Music City where if you buy, like, in the one bin that I like. River you, City. At, I'm sorry, River City. They have a thing where if you, um, you know, buy three, you get a deal or whatever. And so the other day I was counting my pennies looking at the ones I wanted, and I – uh I did come home with some good uh, some good VHS scores, so uh, we'll, we'll see what happens today. You know what? To, talking about Soup Town, I love that we used to drive down when we were 16. We had an 18-year-old driver, and we'd go. We went to a place called Tommy Burns Bar because you could drink. You have, number one, the drinking age was lower. It was 18 and superior back in the 70s. We'd go in. My grandpa owned a bar, so I had been in a bar, but I'd never ordered in a bar. So... We're sitting there, two 16-year-olds, and the bartender comes. It was Tommy Burns' bar. And he goes, what do you have? And they go, you know, so I'm thinking, well, I've watched a you know, cowboy show. The cowboys at the bar. I said, I'll have a beer. And he goes, let's try that again. <laughs> so <laughs> I looked at the guy next to me, and he's having a Budweiser. I said, we'll have a Budweiser. He goes, that's better. But anyway, I got my car fixed over there, to, I don't know, this fall. Via my friend Holly Shiro to, to her fix-up guy. He was a lifelong uh, superior guy. They call it Soup Town for a reason. He said when he was in high school, there was 125 bars in Superior, which I think is a bar for every three people. Now there's like 180. Yeah. <laughs> it's like every two people. It's a good you ratio. count people's backyards next to the bars. <laughs> <laughs> well, this has been so much fun. We want to thank our guest uh, in the first hour, Mark Ingebrigtsen. His show tomorrow is at the West Theater called Jay's Longhorn. Let's make us human. We'd like to thank our guest, Bella, who did a nice job with not only her original song, but the national anthem. I'll be at River City Records at 3 o'clock today doing a free show. And uh, go there and buy some records. They support us very well. And my good buddy Danny Klecko at Fitker's Bookstore from 3 to 5, 600 East Superior Street. This is Paul Metzler. Thanks for listening to The Wall. Thanks for listening to Stars Over the Prairie Radio. I want to thank my co-host, Paulie G. Chris Allen. Follow me at paulmetzler.com. And like my dad used to tell me, remember to be kind and make someone happy. I 
Marshall can see. Stars over the prairie, stars over the prairie tonight. And I wish I could see stars over the prairie. 